I think we're going to kick off by seeing by a raise of hands if we have any gamers in the audience. Quite a few. Are there any of you who've played within a futuristic uh, setting in a game? Yes. Interesting. I think we might have a lot more hands if we had some uh, 12 to 18 year olds, more of those, because <laughs> that's, uh, that's what, what's happening at the moment as well. And I'm, I'm just, uh, I, was, I was fascinated by the fact that Francis Arnold talked about writing the future as a team, because I would say that that's something that connects the three of you. Hilma with, for 20 years, creating this game with, with the gamers in this world, and Camilla with, with the project Utopian Stories, where you're collecting stories from the wider public about their ideas of utopia. And uh, Anthony, with the contest that you did, uh, the, the Future of Life Institute this spring, where you uh, asked uh, participants to create the future of 2045 with uh, AI as a very important aspect of that. And uh, I'd like to start out with asking you about uh, the, the importance of, of bringing in other disciplines, of bringing in other perspectives on on uh, the, predicting the future and creating the future in, 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 uh, in arts, in gaming, in literature. And why, why is that important to have that perspective, you think? Camille, you want to start out? Well, if we're going to write the future, maybe it's, it's very important to not have the technological or the scientific sort of kind of future stories, but also from fiction, from ordinary people, from all kinds of the many flowers, as was talked about before. And I think especially fiction is producing those stories in a very special way. They don't really have to stick to the boundaries. They can experiment and uh, elaborate and, and use the stories as a kind of playground to, to, to get other kinds of future, or maybe even totally new ideas of how to break the boundaries of what's not going so good today. So I think it's very important to bring in the arts and also uh, common people to, to help building those stories. And as a, as a physicist, how do you feel about sort of the, the culture uh, segment trying to, to invade this space, so to speak? I, I don't think it's an invasion. I, I think the, you know, we tend to think of nowadays anyway, is the future is being created by technology, and that is a huge part of it. A lot of the, the big changes that we've seen over the last century or two have been driven by technology, but just as importantly, they've been driven by society and social progress and the social structures that we've built to deal with and channel those technologies. So I, I think, you know, technologists tend to, you know, they tend to like to have it both ways. They, um, they have this drive behind what they're trying to develop that they want to make the world a better place often, but at least they'll say so. Um, but if you then ask them about, you know, what are the moral or ethical implications, what are the risks, what are the dangers? Well, that's not really up to me. I'm just making the technology. That's for society to decide. Um, and I think there is some truth to that. I think there, it's a little bit unfair for them to have it both ways, but it is fair to say that we have to build the social structures and the institutions that lead to the sort of future that we want to have. The technology itself is going to drive it, you know, in one way or another. But if we wanted to drive it in a way that is sort of beneficial for a large number of people in a society we want, we're really going to have to take charge of that. Would you like to add to that, Emma? Uh, so to create something like Game Online was very multidisciplinary with people with PhDs in physics and economies. Um, I have a degree in computer science, but we also had fashion designers, painters, and we also just had people from the streets of Reykjavik because we were doing this post dot com bubble and working on the internet was not very cool back then. So uh, um, it was a very sort of motley sort of combination of people. Also a little bit Icelandic. Uh, Iceland is such a tiny country. You, you can't really have single disciplines for anything. There's really just one person that knows that thing. So you have to uh, <laughs> sort of uh, work with what you've got. Um, and I, I think it shows in the outcome that it wasn't created by any single discipline. There's a lot of like friction and al amalgam coming from that. Uh, and I think a lot of the culture that arises from the sandbox that is even line uh, is evidenced by that kind of initial condition. And one of the questions about sort of portraying the, the future in fiction is, it, will you make it uh, dystopic or utopian? And uh, um, you, you want to, Camilla, ask the, the, the audience about those two? 
Well, from from my perspective, I'm I'm a literary scholar, and there is a basic difference between how they work. I think uh, dystopia is taking something we see here in in here and now, which we are scared of in some kind of way. It's it's maybe it's uh, scary with the AI and things like that. And the dystopian story is exploring that. What if it goes this bad? But the utopian also starts in here and now, but it makes a good alternative out of that and try to think differently in an optimistic way. But then historically, the utopian stories have developed in very many different sort of directions. From the start, it was just a blueprint, of a totally complete country where someone ended up in and everything was ready and, and nothing to add in that country. But nowadays, the utopias are more in process, and we can follow the characters in the, in, in this kind of fiction, uh, how they build and how they struggle and so on, in the process of building the good world, sort of. So, yeah. You want to ask? Uh, so, I mean, we very specifically wanted to create a dystopian world. It's capitalism <laughs> gone wrong in all the ways it could go wrong. And it's gone wrong for 20,000 years. That's how bad it is. <laughs> um, the first thing we wrote down in the script between, behind the one line was, death is a serious matter. Second line was like, what about fear? Like these were the <laughs> sort of topics. Um, and you would think that such a dystopic creation would just lead to evil things. But uh, what has been the, so far the results of the experiments is that when you create a world like that, uh, the people that come into it, they bring the light. And if you have already created darkness, there is something to light up. If you create a utopian creation, it's usually idea of the few and forced on the many. Mm -hmm. But when you create dystopia, you have freedom to create your own utopia out of it. So um, we did not deliberately know, go into it with this. We were not that smart. But in hindsight, it was the best idea to create an evil place to define what it means to be good. So the winning strategy in Evil Line is to do what you say and say what you do and be a trusting person. Um, and that's kind of been the story so far in the 20 year social experiment where millions of people have come into Evil Line. The people that rise to the top are the people that uh, exhibit properties of being good. But, but your, the contest that you arranged was that was a utopian project uh, in, in, in that the, the, so the ground rules was that the world, you didn't want there to be any big wars going on in the future in this scenario, and that there was sort of there was progress in a way that why, why was that an important starting point? Yeah, we, I mean, we deliberately avoided the word utopian for, for many of these historical reasons. It tends to be kind of the origin of a dystopia is a utopia, but I think just saying that things have gone fairly well is so radical nowadays. Um, I, I think we've we've gotten to this point where most of the collective vision of humanity, at least in in the West, and especially I think among young people, is is so bleak. Um, and it and I think w whether that sort of originates from our media or the media is channeling the the feeling that is is there is unclear. But I think we wanted to say, well, what happens if we try to have visions that aren't quite so bleak? That just things more or less work out, that there isn't dystopia, there isn't catastrophe, there isn't world wars and AI takeovers and horrible, even worse pandemics. Um, and I think there, there's actually sort of a hunger for that. I think there, there is, you know, the dystopias in Hollywood are getting a little tiresome uh, over and over again. And I also think that, you know, I strongly believe that, uh, you know, our sort of socio-technological system like life itself is something that sort of works with goals. You know, we, uh, we can meander along and just hope that technology somehow makes everything better by itself. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. I think we need individually as in our own lives and at some level collectively to have some goals that we want to work toward because otherwise we're going to just stray off into strange places. So, so the idea of this contest was to try to build some of those visions um, see what people come up with, see what different futures are out there that uh, are plausible, that we really could have, um, but just are pretty decent. That didn't seem like, like such a big ask, but it is a lot harder to do than the dystopic ones. <laughs> but just to put it to the audience then, if I could see a raise the hands, who prefers utopian stories? 
but, and who <laughs> would rather read it or watch a dystopian story? I think it's quite <laughs> even, actually, a little bit more. It's than your the fault. <laughs> 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 but but how, oh, Camilla, when, how do we make uh, utopian stories more compelling then? What, what, what? How do we make utopian stories more compelling? Oh, <laughs> well, that's an interesting. But maybe that, that thing I was talking about before, that it, it has to have a kind of process and, and, and in terms of building narratives, it's very important to have a kind of conflict and something happening inside. So, so maybe if um, we get that kind of story going, that, that something happens more, it's not, not, not ending up in something that's completely... Uh, ready, but I would like to, to comment on your because I, I really underwrite all, all the things you are saying before, and um, I also think I mean we, we need stories to uh, positive stories to to steer in a direction and not anywhere sort of and and we really wanted to involve young people in this process. It's really important because when I teach at university and I have workshops with younger people and, and there's a lot of despair out there. It's people are it's it's dark, not not only in the Hollywood stories, but also in, in reality. And to build utopian stories and to try to broaden the the ability to, to think more different kinds of future is really important, I think. And to, to nudge to to inspire young people to build more varieties that step out of the norms and actually use fantasy as well. Not only what's plausible, in our project they can fantasize ahead, they can do whatever they want. And I think we can use that also in a good way. And, and, the, and the thing is to break out a little bit from the boundaries and dare to, to step out of the box. So I think in that sense, I think utopias can be thrilling to, to write them, maybe not to read them, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I'll maybe uh, uh, counter that a bit. So um, half the audience wanted to rather uh, read a dystopian story. And I think in a dystopian story, in a dystopian world, you have more agency because there are problems to solve. If you read about utopia, then it's like, what should I really do here? It seems all to be thought out. I'm just carefully and happily, sedatedly marching along. There's nothing to do here. <laughs> so uh, if we believe, uh, which I don't know if it's true, but if we believe that here, that uh, the young are despair and they, they lack hope, then it's our failure to have given them hope. But it's also their agency of like, okay, if the adults have lost all hope, seemingly, well, we're gonna fix it then. So I would have, faith in the younger generation of just fixing it for us, because obviously we seem to be talking about our failure of having fixed it for them, and thus created dystopia. But that gives them marvelous agency of standing up and generating their own hope. I have faith in that happening. But, it, but, it, <laughs> but it's, it's interesting because um, each of your projects and ha has sort of reached out to, to many people to see what their ideas are. And I'm wondering what, what sort of surprised you about their, about their ways of conjuring up a new world? I, I could start. Um, well, another thing that I, that I do is uh, run this online prediction platform. And one of the things we've discovered from that is even when you ask a question like, will this happen or will that happen? Often you get none of the above. You know, reality is very tricky that way. Um, and I think that came through in the, in the, you know, that comes through as we read the news, but it also came through in these visions of the future where many of the key, uh, like, triggers for the big social and technological changes were just weird things that happened. Um, so in one of the stories, for example, there was a, a pandemic that was worse than COVID. It ended up with a lot of people having, like, serious mental damage. Um, and this led to a huge push for brain computer interfaces because that was a way that they could more or less make these people functional again. So this completely changed the history of the world uh, by sort of accelerating this merging with uh, technology and these brain computer interfaces, whether you like that or not, this is what happened in that world, uh, by just decades because of this tragic thing, it turned out in this world to be really, really positive. So I think there were, it was very interesting for me to see uh, some of these negative events or kind of things out of left field 
that ended up making this positive transformation? Mila? Shall I go? Yeah. <laughs> okay. One, one thing that I found when I took a little sneak peek, because we haven't really collected all of it yet, but I've, I, I've been taking a sneak peek into it, is that it's almost all of them are talking about urban settings. Everybody lives in cities in the future. Um, and, and, and that amazed me, because at the same time, it's clear that it's very important with ecology and, and the green future and so on. But it, the way they incorporate it is often to entangle the, the architecture with really fantastic ways of li co-living with, with nature in new urban, multi-species kind of really intricate ways. That, that was quite fantastic to read about that. <coughs> yeah, uh, so what has been the most inspiring from this experiment has been, in a way, what uh, people that have spent decades inside Demon Line, which is a, a, a place full of conflict, death and destruction. Uh, and you have to organize um, thousands of people against that, in a way. Um, and often against other people. It's also part of why the, the world has been going on for 20 years. It's largely in an internal on conflict about limited resources in the world. People that rise to the top of that, they end up leading uh, tens of thousands of people across the planet, time zones, with, uh, with very rudimentary tools we have put into the world, and they've largely created their own tools. And when I talk to them, um, they attribute a lot of their own human growth uh, from having dealing with that perpetual conflict, managing um, the troops, so to speak, uh, to propaganda, to espionage, to security protocols. Uh, they do so many things to make this kind of war simulation end up in their favor. Um, and that's again, like it seems to be the bigger you make the problems, the more it engages our humanity. So, uh, uh, and it's again just harping on the same point. <laughs> the, the harsher the conditions, the more we seem to arise to the occasion. And maybe our world today has just been made a little too predictable. And uh, sure, we have big problems, but the, there's a lot of kind of small problems which we've just taken away. So maybe we, we should introduce more smaller problems so that we have a, a, a slippery slope to tackling the bigger problems. Well, or make sure that, the, that people are really connected to those bigger problems in a way that they feel like they can band yeah. together and work on. Because I... I love that vision, um, and, and I think part of what drives despair is the feeling that there are these huge problems without the sense of agency, that they're mm -hmm. somebody else's job to solve them and they're not solving them, at, or that they're inexorable. Um, so I think we can, uh, we can agree, I, I think, completely that the, the world has enough big problems right now, um, but that sense of let's band together and fix them, and that we can fix them if we band together, I think that is less absent than we would like it to be. And I think that could uh, both help solve the problems and give the sense of agency and the sense of sort of reality that you're pointing to. Uh, my personal feeling is we're not in danger of too much utopia at the moment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> but, but you've also said that you hope in the future the wars will only take place within the games, which I think it says something about our belief or the fact that, that storytelling also creates the future, not only thinking about it, but also pushing us in a direction. How, how is, is it that powerful a tool, would you say, Camilla? Yeah, I think this, if you take the analogy that you made on your speech, where you create a sandbox and yep. you throw in all the people and they are evolving in there. So they mm. get, get the space to expand and evolve and think new within. I think also uh, literature or fiction or stories can function in another way, and it is to actually create new sandboxes, if mm -hmm. we stick to the analogy. Uh, and that's what we are hoping for in our project. It's a really big demand to put on young people, of course. Please, create a new world. But, but we, literature have the ability, with imagination, which is so fantastic with human people, we, c we can put together pieces in 
totally new ways and somewhere there the totally new can be born, I think. And it's, it's really important function of literature, storytelling, creative stories and so on. How, how do you feel about storytelling, the power of storytelling in this instance? I, I think it's critical. I mean, I, I think that's the sort of creature we are. Um, even when we make this, you know, when we uh, justify our decisions, we're often, you know, making a decision and then telling a story about it rather than like actually reasoning through to the conclusion. Um, I think stories are inspiring to people and I think they, people want to feel like they're s sort of part of an, a larger narrative. They've got the story of their own life, but I think they do implicitly have the story of the world that they're in. And I think the story that most people are carrying of the world that they're in right now is a bit more of a tragedy um, than we would like it to be. Um, so, so I think uh, individually in our own lives and collectively having a story that, that sort of doesn't end badly um, and, and is an open-ended one, uh, I think would be a huge benefit. So, uh, because you were mentioned some of the conversations were happening about like, if the war is taking place in even line, does it need to place, take place on planet Earth? So wars largely happen to satisfy emotional needs of some small man somewhere. Uh, it's usually how they come to happen. And they're usually wars about resources. The resources are usually to satisfy emotional needs. 20% of economic activity on this planet is about physical needs. The rest are emotional needs. For example, people like to climb Mount Everest. There's no reason to do it. Believe me, there is nothing up there. It's been checked out. <laughs> but people have this enormous emotional need for the presumably danger of doing it. And it's turning Mount Everest into a garbage dump. Uh, and there are queues of people being carried up by Sherpas uh, to do that. And now they have a job in doing that, um, which might be actual economic activity for them. But certainly the people going up Mount Everest are just doing it for their ego and their emotional needs. Just stop doing that. Just come to EVE Online, get <laughs> out of this ruinous behavior on the planet Earth and satisfy your emotional needs in the virtual worlds, and let's leave the Earth alone. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's all we have time for, I'm afraid. Thank you.